In spring, we rode our bikes to Chester Creek to watch burnouts jump the deeps. Rolling downhill, we whispered their weird nicknames to each other. Sig Sour, Cream Leg, Air. Pack-a-day delinquents, they fought each other, fought their parents, failed high school classes, refused athletics. They cut themselves with razor blades to make homemade tattoos. We repeated scornful stories told by each other's older brothers, but when we told them to each other, scorn gave way to awe. I heard Air spelled it wrong, and he has multi-cure written on his shoulder. I heard about the deeps before I saw them. In the spring, Chester Creek became a river hurtling snow melt to Lake Superior, a cold, cold rapids running the entire length of the city. A few hundred yards from the lake, the creek exploded into a 25-foot waterfall, and the deeps were at the bottom of this pool, the size of two cars. 20 feet deep for a few weeks in May, 15 feet deep in June, shallow and deadly again by mid-July. All of this was contained inside a deep ravine spanned by an old railroad bridge. The bridge ran about five feet behind the falls and about 20 feet above them. So if you were trying to jump into the deeps, it would be as if you were standing on top of the pulpit here, trying to land in the spot right next to Brendan if that spot were 50 feet lower. If you leapt off the top rail of the bridge with enough force, you could arc out over the, over the falls to hit the deeps feet first. The burnouts looked tense as they climbed the bridge's railing. On the top rail standing against the sky, I remember Sig Sauer was a cipher, a piece of Hellenic statuary, cigarette in hand, stern countenance disallowing fun or fear. And then when he leapt, too much of both, too much fun, too much fear. The Burnouts flew while falling, falcons on the wing, which isn't to say they made flight look easy. It looked impossible. Muscle-thin bodies twisting in the cold spring air. There was always total silence as they fell. I remember their friends bearing witness, always blaring Ozzy, they turned the music off before each jump. Dozens of kids who couldn't or wouldn't sit still in school became reverent at the deeps. Those quiet rowdies taught us how to hold silence, and we held the silence. Silence while a teenager flew. Silence until the air was broken by the crack of skin on water. You didn't hear a splash. Switchblade bullies cut the water perfectly. It was something to see a body hit the bullseye, slice the water, sink into the deeps. But even after that, even after the jackknife was landed perfectly, we would refrain from cheering. If anything, our quiet just intensified. It was awful waiting for a burnout to resurface wondering if the deeps were deep enough. We baptized infants at my church, so when our Sunday school lesson turned to Jesus' baptism in the river, my only frame of reference was air, cream leg, sig sour. I still remember the roar of relief we'd feel each time one of them survived the leap. I can still see in my mind's eye Sig Sauer's head emerging from the water, his face beaming brighter than the sunlight glinting off the gold plate on his thin necklace. He didn't pump his fist. He smiled. A little child, as the entire congregation shouted out our hallelujah, and it sounded like this, yeah! 
just roaring in that ravine, usually preceded by a few choice curse words. My friends and I were not, of course, a part of the congregation. We watched all of this go down from a safe distance. We were 10, 12 years old, and five years later, we had become those same student council types who scorned and mocked the deeps. It wasn't our fault. We were told what to do, and we behaved like proper little bureaucrats. Get good grades, get ahead, iron out anything within your soul that makes you strange. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. He was despised and mocked. Why were we drawn to the deeps as children? Why did I spend my Saturday afternoons watching despised young people sing along to Ozzy Osbourne? Because I went to Sunday school. Because I paid attention to Jesus and his story. God takes what is despised or overlooked and uses it to reveal her majesty. But over time, the world asserts itself, and the world will retrain your vision. And you become blind to the fact that teenage rebels can fly. You forget that the bridge exists. You wipe the deeps from your mind. All of which is to say that the title of this sermon makes very little sense. The church is God's hope for the world. It sure made very little sense to me the first time I saw this on some UCC promotional material in about 1987, bubbly 80s letters posted on a bulletin board in the basement of Pilgrim Congregational. The church is God's hope for the world, really. Really, I was at my most sophisticated then. The church smells like an antique grade school, Strange school, doesn't teach anything that's going to be on an AP test. It didn't have a pool. The food was unpredictable in every sense of the word. Sometimes there would be super abundance, 15 hams at a potluck attended by 35 people. Other times, it was obvious that Mrs. Andreessen had accidentally ashed her cigarette into the hot dish while she was making it. That's the church, not hopeful material. Science, I would have said back then, science, as bad as I was at it, science is the hope for the world or our innate capacity for good. The economy is God's hope for the world or American ideals or American weaponry. The church can't be anything, really. I had all these thoughts in 1987 in a church that had Tiffany stained glass windows, two full-time pastors, a budget surplus, and 400 people in worship every single Sunday, even though the church only had 500 members. People went to worship. It was the last bastion of Christendom. In some corners of the upper Midwest, 1955 was alive and well in 1987. Today that church has a handful of members and a part-time pastor and the organist makes the bulletins. That's God's hope for the world. Three weeks ago, I was riding my bike down Logan Boulevard on a Sunday night. I saw a church that looked like God's hope for the world, or at least a church that looked like it could be that. The church looked so good, I hit my brakes and stopped right in the middle of the road. The limestone on this building gleamed. It was clean. I don't think I've ever seen a sparkling clean church exterior in my life. Inside the lights were on, glowing through polished stained glass windows. Even the landscaping looked good. So I got off my bike and I walked a little closer. I wanted to see the name of the place. I wanted to read the sign on the church's front door. As I got closer, I could hear music, of course, because it was a church. As I got a little closer, I realized it was Steely Dan that was playing. Who are these people? What have they done to look so good? What's the name of this place? Small sign on the front door. I leaned a little closer to read it. You already know what it said. Cast management. Condominiums. Condominiums. Over 30 churches in Chicago have become luxury housing in the past 20 years. The church is God's hope for the world? 
If that was hard to believe in 1987, it's even more unlikely now, right? We're easier to overlook today than we were 40 years ago. And thus, we're closer to the truth. Closer, I think, to being the truth that God calls us to be. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. God uses the ignored and overlooked to reveal his majesty. That is a truth little children grasp far more readily than rational adults. It's why I was drawn to the deeps as a 10-year-old, which isn't to say that the deeps was like a church. Beyond God's tendency to use what is rejected for God's purposes, the teenagers at the deeps had very little to sustain the power that came into being when they gathered. Black Sabbath and the force of an entire community's disapproval will only take you so far, right? Then you're going to run out of gas. Even inadvertent idols are guaranteed to let you down. Meanwhile, here in the real church, the true church, here in this place, here in these walls and in your connection to one another that is created and sustained within these walls so that it can shine brightly outside of them, Here's what we have, and as much as I still love Ozzy, it's a lot better than Ozzy. We have true light from true light. We have an ancient tradition that is not afraid of change. We have a place, and we are a people who revere the best of the past while always forging ahead. 502 years old. Protestant Christianity, and it began by dissolving all claims of an essential distinction between clergy and laity. That's what kicked us off. That's what got us rolling, the ability to look at different kinds of people and say at the heart of it, there is nothing essential that is different about you. And if you think that it is this tradition which is at the forefront of the inclusion of trans people in God's church. If you think it's an accident that we started there and wound up here 500 years later, well, I wish I had 40 minutes to draw every single line for you. God, we saw this from the moment we started, God is no respecter of persons. God loves all of us. And this is why our tradition was able to ordain a woman in the late 18th century, the United Church of Christ. In the late 18th century, there are churches a stone's throw from this building who are still afraid to have that conversation. Ordained, we did, an out gay man in the early 1980s. Some churches are so afraid of Jesus that they take his words and make some sort of ugly totem from them and then use it to ban him as they bar the door. But here in this place, and this might sound grandiose, but I believe it with everything I've got. Here in this place, we have the power of God. We left the doors open and the power of God stepped in. And God uses the church to show the world who he is as a beachhead, as a colony, as a place in which the kingdom that hasn't yet arrived has already begun. Jeff said three weeks ago, scripture tells us we don't go up to heaven at the end. Heaven comes down to earth at the end of history. And here in this place, here in the church, that has already begun. You are a royal priesthood. You are a royal priesthood. You are, you, right over here, you are. And here, back here, you are. The altos and the sopranos, a royal priesthood. You 
who might have come to church because your parents dragged you here today. You are a member of a royal priesthood. You who might doubt every single thing I've said so far today. You are the member of a royal priesthood. Why are we standing strong 176 years after a group of immigrants realized they needed to be the church? Why after nearly eight years as your pastor haven't I seen a single skeleton fall out of the church's closet? It's not because they're so well secured, it's because there aren't any. Why is this place so healthy? It's not because we are Chicago's most sterling collection of individuals. I won't belabor that point, right? But you're not a priest unto yourself. You're the member of a royal priesthood. And that is because I think God wants to use this church. God wants to use this church. It is because this tradition, forward thinking but rooted in the gospel, Biblical enough to look for God at the vanguard of every movement in our society and biblical enough to know that she's not in every single one of them. That this tradition, our tradition, is God's hope for the world. And when everything about our era of Christianity has been said and done, St. Paul's will not be a faded memory. We will not be some sort of ecclesiastical greenfield village, and we won't be a church with a $100 million endowment, a rigid set of bylaws, and 19 members. I guarantee you that. We will be St. Paul's. Probably not all that different from who we are right now. Regular people gathered into something powerfully strange. God's peculiar possession. God's royal priesthood. A royal priesthood. My God, we need to hear that kind of ennobling language. A royal priesthood. You know the world is cruel when the best title a person can aspire to is he made a lot of money and it didn't wreck his personality, right? That's a cruel world. You are the member of a royal priesthood. That first title, that's the best title a person can get. The rest of us get things like student loan debtor, guy who got divorced, woman who goes to the pharmacy suspiciously often, right? You know it's a cruel world when the best title you can aspire to is member of the Democratic Party, University of Wisconsin alumni. Sorry, Badgers. <laughs> we were walking the dog yesterday. I saw a line about 40 feet, 40 people deep outside Rinaldi's at 1030 in the morning. Everybody in their red sweatshirts couldn't wait to get into the football game. That's not a bad thing, but it's not the best claim on your identity. You aren't a vice president or an alumnus or a failure. You are a royal priesthood, God's peculiar possession. Peculiar. Peculiar. God uses what is easily overlooked, the ignored and the outcast, the increasingly numerically insignificant mainline Protestant church. That's a quote from the New York Times. God uses us to reveal his majesty. Last week, Sarah said, Pastor Sarah said in her sermon, that we learn things on mission trips we would never know without them. When I went to Haiti last year, I learned how miraculous this place is and how powerfully strange. I had to get off the block to learn this lesson. I hadn't been out of the country since I was eight years old, 40 years. I am a proudly parochial person, right? I am not an adventurous traveler. It makes me anxious. So, I was getting off the plane in Haiti, and I was nervous. And you could see other people from the United States who were traveling down there, and some of them, it was quite obvious, had bodyguards. And I felt nervous, we didn't have a bodyguard. And then I looked to my left. I looked to my left, and there was Mary Brown. And I looked to my right, and there was Barb Kaiser. And I just felt infused 
with confidence. And I knew I would be safe. I knew this as surely or even more so than I would have if Barb and Mary had been two NFL tight ends armed with (laughs) flamethrowers. And they're not, right? They're both retired nurses. They're both tough women, but they don't make anybody shake in their shoes when they walk into a room. But I know. And I knew how strong they are. And I knew that I would be safe because these two and all of you, you're living stones and together we are built into a mighty fortress, God's peculiar possession, St. Paul's Church.